what we wanted with Songnim, and I think uh, you get the message. So, first we have talent on the on the scene, as you've seen, in different areas and uh, sectors. Uh, and this new generation, and I see it uh, day to day in my life. You you witness it as well. Needs a purpose. You can read it. You can experience it yourself. And I think. They are part of the solution. I hope we could show it to you. And, and uh, we have, it's part of the solution, by the way, for us, not only to explain all the rational aspect, but also to put more emphasis on the purpose. So I would like to open the floor to questions on the technical aspect of climate change, but also on what this young generation is expecting and uh, how they would like to engage with you, as you show in the case of Liang. Uh, the, the call for diversity, the for call for uh, finding a solution altogether, which is part of the solution. Open for question. Yes. I wonder if it's not too rude if each of you could tell us how old you are. <coughs> we heard 25, so you don't have to say it again. <laughs> 35. You should, should not have corrected <laughs> me. <laughs> yeah. I like being 35. I'm 31. Oh, my. So not quite as young as the others, but 37. I'm 35. Me as well. And that was not part of your question. <laughs> <laughs> Just give this one. So, yes, please. This is just a wonderful moment. I'm very touched with your lineup of you know, future leaders of the world. Congratulations on this panel. My name is Tatsu Master. I'm the MB professor in Japan, also chairman in London, of capital, uh, fair good capital in London. I need your advice, please. I belong to the Energy Environment Workshop. We had a long debate on how to narrow the generational gap on climate change perception. And we came to an idea next year in UN Climate Summit in September 2020, we will respond to Greta Thunberg's challenge with something concrete measures. But do you think this is a great idea for our generation to do to bridge the gap with younger generations or you have a second thought? Please give us advice what to do. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take maybe uh, another question. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. It's a great presentation, very enlightening. Um, I just want to add something because you all spoke technical. I, to give the, the, the subject a bit of a geopolitical perspective. Um, the climate change has a political implication. I'm a specialist on Syria. And what led to the Syrian crisis, of course there was corruption, oppression, you name it, but there was a drought, you know, that came to Syria that year, and of course the government is inefficient and oppressive and doesn't care, that led to one million people, one million people in rural area to be uh, driven below poverty line, and they went to the, to the cities, you know, and suburbs, in, and this is what led to major discontent, and this was the spark for the revolution. Also, a lot of uh, a lot of um, intertribe um, uh, intergroups uh, fighting in Iraq is on, on 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 areas that have that have water. So, what I want to say, the climate change is not in our health in 50 years. It's to also leading today to political instability, especially area like Syria in Iraq, which is the most arid area after the basin of India. Every seven years, they have one year of drought. And you know we don't have uh, any efficient solution. I want to add something, but there are. I mean, you spoke, Jihan uh, spoke about about water scarcity. Well, there are solutions. Uh, for example, the Mekong River. You know, Laos, Vietnam, and Cambodia. They did a rotation presidency where the the, the government of the three countries um, discuss among them uh, and source project to better benefit from this water. Thank you. Another question? Oh, we answer. Yes. Hello. <coughs> Hi, my name is Manu. I'm from India. I have a question for Peter. So uh, it's a difficult one. I don't know how to articulate it really. So uh, I study international relations. Yeah? So they trained me to be 
thinking as a realist. Yeah. So uh, my question is, would it be better not to talk about the profit motive, you know, uh, and seek climate change or, or the combat uh, as, as an industry? The reason I ask this is, again, coming from maybe a cynical point of view, yeah, that I draw an analogy with uh, what's happening uh, around the world when we speak of war. They say war is a business. Um, one of the reasons we have constant endless war is the military industrial complex. So I ask this question because would you say <coughs> we have the risk that somewhere down the line there are interests you know, that rise to almost sabotage uh, the objective behind the scenes because it's business. Okay, so three sets of question. One on uh, the generation and gender, uh, one on geopolitics and one on finance. So the good news is that you're six, so I want two to answer per question. Pick your battle. Let's start with you, Gian. It's easy. So <coughs> yeah, it gives time answer. for the others to think <laughs> about what they want. Um, yeah, I'm completely aligned with you. The, the effects of climate change are already there, and we see them in Africa more than anywhere. Um, I referred to the um, deforestation, but there is also the uh, desertification uh, um, that is happening today. The soil is, is growing, and it's leading actually the growers the, um, to move their, um, their herds down south. And they move down south to the agricultural lands. And actually now there are uh, a lot of troubles and tribe conflicts between the growers and, uh, and the farmers and leading to extreme violence, especially in Nigeria, for example, and also in north of Mali. And we also have the problem, as you said, of drought. And we had it in Africa like the, in the last two years in Austria and East Africa. And the effects were dramatic. The, the prices of the crops are increased. Uh, people on extreme uh, poverty are, couldn't, couldn't afford to, to feed themselves. Um, but to be able to have innovative solutions like the one you referred to, for example, in the Mekong uh, River, um, it would be possible if we, were, we, we had um, more geopolitical stability. Uh, to be able to do that, we need to talk to each other, the countries, and to build alliances. And, uh, and this is actually operationally very complicated today. But uh, I hope that because of the urgency and the momentum, at some point, uh, our um, heads of states will realize that there is an emergency too and that we need to, to, to talk to each other and to find solutions because it's a, it's a problem that is concerning everyone and everyone will be facing it uh, at the end of the day. Thank you. <coughs> James, maybe a compliment? Yeah, so to the, to the first question in terms of what can be a concrete measure that you could bring forward, um, again, I think we're all looking for that. I would just encourage you, as you think about those concrete measures, think ultimately about, about the issue of inequality. And this is what I was trying to touch on mostly, is that it, ultimately you need to think about how, how can you enable people to actually use those measures? Right? There's one thing to, to have good policy, there's one thing to have good tools, but if people in the end aren't able to make use of those, if people aren't able to internalize those because of other externalities, because of the concern for you know, the sa their safety, their, their, uh, their safety or security in their work, they're just not gonna get there. Those tools won't actually be used as efficiently as you hope they will. Thank you. So Peter on finance, and then I will ask Paulina because I'm sure she has a different view. Um, so ahead. I have a rather direct question to me. So, <laughs> um, so I kind of wanted to touch on some of the generational um, conversation too, is because, and I wanted to use actually um, a very personal example, is that um, you know, uh, trying to narrate what we do is so fascinating right now, particularly within venture capitalists, particularly with old venture capitalists, in convincing them that they should invest follow-on finance in our portfolio companies. So there are two different languages that I find myself speaking. Um, one which is about my conviction about how we should consume less, we should do all of these different multi-pronged approaches, and I can focus on the impact slant of things. Interestingly, not all of mainstream venture capital cares about that. 
So to some degree, I have to then go from talking to an entrepreneur who is very inspired about what they're doing and have so much conviction around that, and then I have to put it on a very different hat and go talk to the Andreessen's of the world, the founders funds of the world, these different sorts of investment funds. Thankfully, all of those firms actually are forward looking. Um, but, um, you know, uh, the other thing that I wanted to touch upon about is what motivates people. Um, you know, we're all motivated by quite human things, um, desire, um, drives, um, love, power, all of these conflicting um, and, and at the same time, you know, um, strangely compatible <laughs> drives. And um, what I notice is that some people are responding better to the narrative when I start talking about money because it is a better anchor for them psychologically and ideologically. Um, and so I want to show people, hey, you can have both. Um, I just try to figure out who my audience might be um, to give them, uh, or to, to understand, or, or, or to, to focus on um, what might motivate them and speak in a language that meets them where they are. <laughs> Thank you. Rational view, Polina. So yeah. I would like to touch a question about uh, young and old people. Let's, I don't know, old is fine to say like this. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what I want to say, if we are talking about uh, human extinction, it's not about old, young, uh, woman, uh, man, it doesn't matter. So we all should unite and fight it. I mean, why do we need a plastic bottle to fill up our cups here? Why we cannot fill up it in advance and bring, uh, I mean, from a cafeteria? Why we make a lot of waste? So uh, we, we, yeah, we, we are all different. It can be different approach from government. But if you have some power in government, so influence on it, if you cannot influence, 25 years you are trying to push some law and it doesn't work, so go to plant trees. At least you will put some positive step in, the, in our planet and you will do s something good. Or, okay, maybe a political uh, sphere is not for you. Go to be engineer and uh, place uh, PV models, be, uh, build wind turbines. It doesn't matter what, just to find your best way where you can be useful. This is what I think. So, Xavier, on this question, on how you mobilize across, because you present us the governance, yeah. the national committee, and then what about the uh, generation gap or diversity? I, th I think and this question is very interesting because on the citizen convention, I think 25% 25 25 of the people are retired. So you have to go over the generation gap because otherwise there won't be no decision in the end. I think um, one of the most important thing that people, let's say, elderly can testify about is how the life improved over the course of their life. Because the carbon that we use, we have used it to, to improve our lives, to, to eat better, to be better, uh, to have better health, to, to have more transportation. <coughs> and the youngsters, they probably don't realize that. That's also probably the reason why they don't understand uh, why the elderly are more attached to the way they live today because they have realized how they lived yesterday. And I think that there has to be a discussion about what we can uh, maybe, as you said, uh, abandon like plastic bottles and I don't know the fact that you, that you have a big huge, huge car and a big house somewhere far from the city and the things that, are, uh, that really matter. Because unlike my neighbor, I, I, I'm not completely sure that technology can produce um, the entire solution, and especially technology without regulation that would be able to generate money out of the air. So out of the air, Liam, you make money out of the air? Yeah, we make a lot out of um, the polluted air. Um, I also wanted to tackle the question of the generation gap. and. Um, Participating in this um, conference, I realized that I also have um, a personal um, generation gap. So I'm still a Chinese citizen. So um, in my life, I didn't have uh, the opportunity to vote for um, any political party. 
And uh, for a very long time, I wasn't really interested in politics, up to the point where I realized that um, voting is not the only opportunity to create change, to um, create innovation. And I think that's um, also where the younger generation um, sees their opportunity, that without a vote, they can also participate and um, in a dialogue create change. And um, from personal experience, I can also say that in our company, um, for instance, our CTO, he has worked for the automobile uh, mobile industry for over 30 years. And um, at a certain point, he got the realization that this is not what he wants to do for the rest of his life and what he wants to leave for the next generation. So it was also his um, personal experience that drove him to our company and um, this again makes it possible to learn from the older generation and learn from their experience on how you can create a sustainable future. Thank you. Yeah, one. yeah with that, please. Uh, first of all, I just want to say it was <coughs> deeply inspiring and thank you all very much <coughs> for what you contributed. Let me throw the policy challenge at you. And we do plant trees, first. <laughs> but, but let me throw the policy challenge. Right now, there's roughly 5.9 to 6.2, the numbers aren't in for 2019, trillion dollars being paid as fossil fuel subsidies today. If you want the figures, you can get them on the IMF website. The problem is about 75% of those subsidies make energy provided by existing energy utilities affordable for people who can't pay market prices for it. About 75% of that 5.9, 6.1 trillion. One problem. How do we shift that package of subsidies, which would make a real difference in terms of creating alternative technology solutions and potentially make some contribution towards changing behaviors? Your point is very valid. How do we shift that into energy transitions that actually focus on deep decarbonization and increasing use of renewables? Point one. Point two, right now we've got about 2,000 gigawatts of coal-fired plants that are less than 12 years old. Yep. The capital cost involved in those particular investments today is gigantic. And most of it is still attracting debt service obligations from either the com countries or the utilities that put it up in the first place. How do we deal with that problem in the context of energy transitions? It's not that we don't need to deeply decarbonize and to shift vastly towards more responsible lifestyles and to the extent that we're going to rely on fuel for electricity and, uh, and mobility, increasing use of renewables, it's how to do the transitions. That's the challenge. You're all making a contribution to it precisely because you're doing that. I'm throwing out the bigger challenge to you, not because I expect answers now. These are really tough questions. But just because that's what we all collectively face if we actually want to get down somewhere close to that 1.5 degree level. Thank you. And, uh, I think it shows how seriously you are taken, given the size of the challenge. <laughs> so thank you for the point. Uh, maybe we'll, we'll see there is another question, and uh, I'll come back on this, because I think it calls for another thing, is how do we carry this conversation forward with the talent we have? I don't, <laughs> like you, I don't think we'll have the answer, right? Especially in 2.47, uh, 2 minutes, 47 seconds. But uh, it's how we carry it forward, and it's a challenge to Somnim and myself, because yes, I think part of the team we have here, and others young leaders we have brought in this, could work on this and, and come with proposition. We, uh, your last question in particular, have been discussed when we have prepared this session, and unfortunately, we acknowledge that we didn't have a proper answer, <laughs> but uh, it is acknowledged, so to your point, so agreed. Another question? Please be kind. Thank you. Oh. Well, Another young leader that can contribute <laughs> to the answer. Well, first of all, thank you so much for your presentation. Very exciting, very inspiring. 
I'm, I'm always, I'm less skeptical than Xavier about technology. I have high hopes in technology to help us move towards new business models that are more like circular economy, economy style, yes. or that help us live with the consequences of the pollution. But for now, whenever I hear about all these fantastic innovations, it's still very localized or regional. And my question is, what should be or what could be the next steps to move from local fantastic innovation to more widespread all around the world? Thank you. Thank you. Who wants to comment? I'll, yeah. try, <coughs> I'll try to give my, share my thoughts for the, your question, sir, on the, the challenge, the policy challenge. Um, I think that it's um, almost impossible to solve the equation uh, of one securing that the um, middle class uh, population still can have access to transportation and then to the carbon taxes. And we see with the example of France what happened when they, they took off the, the carbon tax. But at the same time, we also need to invest uh, so for me, it's not a shift of the budget. I think that the, we have to realize that we need to spend money and more money and more debt in, to be able to address that problem. <clears throat> and I think that if it's more debt today, it's going to be less investment tomorrow to try to solve. It's going to be too late. So better in, spend the money now and, and try to, to push that transition without... Uh, um, harming in the, the livelihood of the population. It's controversial, but I think that that is necessary in this case. Thank you. Uh, we are at the end of the time, so I so a couple of other questions. You still have the opportunity to engage with our young leaders. I think on the last point, we take the challenge to build something and structure something, maybe not before one year, but in preparation uh, to be discussed with Thierry how he wants to handle, because uh, big challenges are thrown to our young leaders. And I think we should say yes to taking the challenges. <laughs> Always say yes. And then get back and surprise you with the answers. Thank you for your participation.